I'm, I'm Fred Dibner, steeplejack and steam engine enthusiast. And quite often people ask me if anything funny has ever happened to me, you know, and it doesn't, there's, there's not, you know, a lot of funny happens. It's just every now and again there's something quite humorous happens, you know, sort of, um, you know, people say things mostly that are rather funny. Things like, me old mate's down on the floor and I'm 200 foot up in the sky and they say to him, has he ever fallen off, you know, which, you know, I mean, bloody ridiculous, you know, if you fall off, you're dead, aren't you, for a start, shovel you up and put you in a bag, you know, cart you off down the road to the bloody undertaker. Um, really, it's half a day out with the undertaker if you fall off. Uh, it's the things that people say over the phone which are quite quite strange some some sometimes like this the, the story here about a weathercock and a very posh architectural firm in Bolton called Bradshaw Gas and Hope and I mean you've got to be a geriatric get a job though you know it, it's a magnificent Georgian building with gas lamps outside and they, they sort of you, you, when you drive by in your car you know you get a vision of the past and they've never moved forward and so that, that sort of feeling you get when you just look at the premises. The thing is, one day, the phone rang and the fella at the other end, he said, it's Bradshaw Gas and Hopes here, he said. He said, we've had a request to provide and fix up a weathercock at St Anne's Church at Tutton, which is a little village outside of Bolton up in the hills, you see. And, of course, I've, I've done the lightning conductor on the church steeple, so... I know all about it, you know, and, I, and uh, the, the ins and outs of the actual building, you see, and the steeple. He said, how much will it cost, this weather vane, you know, and, and I said, well, here's 400 quid and I'll make you one two foot long and 18 inches deep and I'll put gold leaf on it and I'll stick it up on top of your church steeple. And he, he, in a nice, polite way, he said, that was excellent, you know, very, very reasonable, you know, we'll send you an order note through the post in a day or two. So a day or two later, order note, provide and fix up weathercock, St Anne's Church at Tutton. So we're off to the scrapyard, sheet of copper, three foot long, two foot deep, three days in the shed with the frets on, the soldering iron and the copper rivets. We've got a beautiful weathercock, but if you think back a year or two, price of gold kept going up and all the bloody painters have been and bought all the, all the gold leaf, you see, so we've not got any gold leaf to put on the weathercock, so we propped it up in corner at shed and buggered off up a chimney somewhere out at Rome. Came home from work at tea time and me and Joan Collins, the ex-wife, like, was still in love then, you see, and I said, has anybody rung, love, about the, you know, anything, you know, the proverbial 10,000 quid job coming? And she said, yeah, she said, Bradshaw, Gas and Hopes have been on about the weathercock. I said, did you tell him we couldn't get no gold leaf? And she said, yeah, she said, I told him that we couldn't get no gold leaf. I said, what did he say? And she said, he said, he said to me, I'm not bothered about the gold leaf, he said. I want to know whether it'll twirl or not. And she said, well, Fred's cock twirls and so will yours when he's done with it. <laughs> All right, you know, he was around two days later with three books of gold leaf to have a look at her, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, people ask me a lot. <laughs> Actually, when I'm going to blow up another factory chimney, and, and my answer to him is, I've never blown anything up in my life, actually. Um, you know, the, the modus operandi is to prop them up on sticks and set fire to the sticks. Yeah, basically, the method, method that was first envisaged, really, in, in, in the 1840-odd and 1850s, the... the the breadth of the Industrial Revolution, a big industrial chimney, were only like 30 feet to 90 feet tall. And engines and boilers and, and plant got bigger. And of course, the first breed of industrial chimney had to be destroyed and got rid of. And I don't quite know who actually invented the method, but basically the method is that you, you chip away half of the base of the chimney and on removing the brickwork, you replace the remove material by wooden props and, and advance round to approximately halfway and then you can tell by the pressure on the woodwork and often an horizontal crack round the back in the brickwork that the thing is now leaning on the wood and then of course it's, it's self-explanatory when you set fire to the wood 
when the wood burns away, the chimney falls down. Or oh, I should do. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't, <laughs> if you've not cut enough brickwork out, but it very rarely happens to me now. <laughs> it used to do in the early days. The, the thing is, um, it is really a much more thorough method, in my opinion, than dynamite, because if you, you remove the right amount of brickwork, and the secret, in my opinion, lies in just keeping the chimney balanced with the timber work, so that when the fire's done its work on the timber and destroys its weight-bearing capabilities, there is no opposition whatsoever for the thing to, to, to take over, you know. If you're going to blow something up, the, the modus operandi nearly always is, is you bore all the shot holes for the dynamite, and you put in the dynamite, and if you put too much in, it blows all the base of the chimney all over the neighbourhood. The secret is, is just to put enough in to fracture the weight-bearing properties of the brickwork, which thereupon, when this is happened, when you press the button, and it's, and it's destroyed the weight-bearing properties of the brick, or the concrete, or whatever, the wall structure then comes over, but it compresses the, the, the busted material, which acts like rollerball burnings underneath the base of it, and the thing starts to go backwards in lots of cases, you know. It's very rare you get a, a very clean operation at the bottom, you know, if you blow it up. But with the pit props and the fire, you can you can actually, you know, have a row of tram tickets behind it and not get them damaged, you know. I mean, I've done one recently which were only four foot six off the side of the mill with a fire escape filling 18 inches or two foot of that space up and it didn't damage the fire escape on the side of the mill, you know, which I would have defied any dynamite merchant to have a go at that, you know, um, sort of thing. I, I got this job some years ago, dismantling a 200-foot factory chimney with the mechanic shop more or less screwed to the bottom of it, about six feet away on one side, and the substation, which brought all the electricity in to run the mill, you see, so, of course... Fell in this chimney were totally impossible. It had got to come down a brick at once. And, and when you're knocking a big chimney down, the top half of it, believe it or not, is the easiest bit because the wall is the thinnest. When you get down to the halfway mark, it's getting pretty thick, maybe two feet or three feet thick, the brickwork. And it's like digging pavements up going round every day. And this particular chimney were particularly tough, you know, and we'd got down about halfway, there'd be about 140 feet of it left. And all day long with a crowbar, you just got about four courses off, which blood, blood blisters on your hands and all of that. And, and things were really bad, you know, so in the pub at lunchtime, consoling ourselves, the, the landlord of the pub had been a fireman down the pit, and he said, why don't you try a few poppers in it, you know, like... For them, it un unenlightened, that means small explosions, you know, to shake it up a bit and get it off a bit easier, you see. And, of course, I said to him, like, you know, the landlord in the pub, I, I said, there's no way court halls will allow me to do anything like that, you know. I, I said, it, we, you know, we'd end up wrecking the, 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 um, the what the hell, um, the, the, the substation, stopping the mill, which would cost thousands of pounds a day, you see. So now I'm thinking more in the lines of, of hydraulics, you know, like an hydraulic ram inside the chimney uh, with a big chisel on the end, you know, sort of thing. And just up the road, they happened to be shutting a colliery and the landlord of the pub knew the engineer at the pit and he, and he gave him a ring on his phone and, and we, went, we went over to the mechanic's shop at the pit and the engineer fitted us up with this great hydraulic ram that had been some sort of railway line bending appliance, you know, when they, when it had a use at the pit. We rigged it up, it took three days to rig it up in the top of the chimney with a big iron pipe connected to it, hanging on a piece of steam pipe across the top on a chain on a swivel. And you could lower the arse end of the pipe down and point the chisel at the, at the brickwork about two foot down and, and by hand working an hand pump, jack out the ram. When the chisel hit the wall, it removed an hefty lump of brickwork, you see. And the wall idea, you circumnavigated the chimney stack with this hydraulic ram, chiselling away gently and shoving it off the edge, you see. And it suddenly struck me that, that at the front 
three quarters of the chimney stack, you, we'd got a football pitch to get it in, you know, and I, and I thought, well, we'll leave that till it's about three feet high, just nibble where the blacksmith shop is and the mechanic shop and where the substation is, and we'll leave the front bit, as we christened it, till it's about three foot high, and then shove a big lump off, you know, because there's plenty of room over that side. And the, the, the three foot lumps got to five foot lumps and then six foot lumps, and ultimately, nine feet tall, and half the circumference of the chimney, which at this point were about 14 feet, with the ram against the, the a piece of 12 before timber against the inside of the chimney, and a few iron wedges knocked in a bed joints at the bottom. After a bit of pressure were applied with the ram at 45 degrees, the whole lump of chimney, half of it, like half a pile of pole elements, broke free. And then, of course... You're dealing with a very unstable piece of brickwork, with it being semicircular, you know. And of course, as it healed over, off its arse, as you might say, we packed it up with timber so it wouldn't do a wobbly and, and turn round on itself. And of course, the great weight of it squashed its own hinge in a way at the front end. And we were only 60 feet from, from the floor, so it weren't too far for keep running down and running around the front and having a look, see how it were going. Now, all human life can be, you know, you cannot mend human life, you can mend buildings, but so all human life out of the mechanic shop and the blacksmith shop had all got to line up at the side of the mill and be counted so we knew where everybody were when one of these great pieces were going to take off over the edge, like, in a way, launching a ship, you know. And the guy who's helping me, believe it or not, played the violin in the alley orchestra, you know, he was someone else, Ken, dead and gone now, God bless him, you know. A, a sort of frustrated Stephen Jay, who, when he should have been practising his violin, he come giving me a lift instead. The thing is, Ken and I have stood on this plank across the hall, the draft in the middle. That's all we had, a couple of planks across the hall. This great, maybe six or seven tonnes of brickwork is poised at 45 degrees, ready to slur off the edge, and the bloody thing broke right down the middle. And one piece fell over the side of the chimney. The other piece eddied back inside with the with the big ram and everything. Smashed the planks in half that we were stood on. And moments before impact, we sprang off the planks onto the walls of the chimney. And the bloody planks and the ram went down the middle. This great lump of brickwork, about five foot square and nine foot tall, went down the middle of the chimney. And the whole chimney shaking and vibrating. The other piece went over the side, broke into two big blocks about five foot square, and one of them hit the ridge pole of the blacksmith shop and the walls went out and the roof come in and I thought, this is the end of my career. <laughs> I can laugh now, but I didn't then. The thing is, down the middle of this mechanic shop were a line shaft of many belts driving many machines and all this line shaft were like a bloody great snake all bent and twisted and all the belts hanging down and steam coming up everywhere. <laughs> oh, God, you know, and it's amazing how long it is before you start shaking when you've had a disaster like that or come to near death, you know, near a meeting the maker that you'll ever be, you know. Um, and the funny side of this, and there is really a funny side, <clears throat> in them days... The engineer in a mill were like a god and a law on upon him, a law onto himself. And this particular guy, he had his own billiard room and a full size billiard table. And one of the lads, one of the mechanics out the mechanic shop, it's dinner time, I'll never forget. He said he ran up to the engineer's office where he's just leaning over the billiard table to take a pot. And the lad says to him, Fred's just wrecked the blacksmith shop. And the engineer says to him in a calm, calm and cool voice, he said, has anybody been killed? And the, and the lad said, no. He said, oh, well, we'll finish the game off then. <laughs> and that was the end of that, yeah. <laughs> but um, it was were, it were a close call, that, believe me, you know. I mean, the nearest really to dying felling one I've ever come is, is, I mean, running away from them on televisions, now to pound, you know. The, this particular chimney were in a place called Mickle Trafford near, near Chester and it were a brickworks that hadn't been a brickworks for 40 years 
And on top of the brick kiln, which was still there, there were actually trees growing that were six inches diameter. So you can tell how, how long, you know, how old, like, in 40 years you'd get a fir tree at six inches. Well, you know, it depends what sort of trees, really. The thing is that we approached the base of the chimney, having had a phone call from some estate agents who said the council had informed them that the thing were dangerous and it had to come down. And when we got there, um, the wall base of the chimney was surrounded with rhododendron bushes and he couldn't see the damn thing at all. You know, anyway, we hacked our way through the undergrowth and came upon the, the just the top of the flue wall where the smoke used to go in from the brick kiln, you see. And the wall base of, or the internal sump of the chimney is full of water. And the brickwork on the inside came down and it went sort of like an underground cave in water. It sort of went down to water level, but it looked so mercifully thin round the outside edge of, of the chimney. It, this, in actual reality, the brickwork had, had been eroded away on the inside from about two feet thick down to nine inches, all the way round the chimney. Now, if you crawled about underneath the bushes, on the grass outside, there were bits and splinters and faces of, of the brick that had flit off through the downward pressure of the rest of the chimney. Now, you think, if I start removing any more brickwork out of the side of there, you know, the pressure could be some, become so great on where it's already suffering with pressure, you know, to, to just collapse upon you and go in any direction the damn thing wants, you see. So, with bated breath and a dry throat, we started to cut a mouthing in the front of it where we were going to put the props to prop the thing up. And eventually, like, trying to make some sort of judgment in between how weak it were down in the foundations and how much brickwork you could take out at ground level before it sort of sheared off down to the weak part at the bottom. Judgment were made anyway. The thing is, I said to me assistant, I can run faster than you, so you go and get out of the way. I will light the fire <coughs> on the chimney and, and start to hammer some more brickwork out of the side, you see. And as the fire burns, I'll still keep hammering, you know, because it's only a little chimney, about eight foot diameter and about 90 feet tall. Now, when, it, when brickwork's got an unbelievable amount of pressure on it and you put the chisel on, on the edge of it and pull the trigger, the, the, the brickwork, you don't flit off a quarter of a brick or half a brick like it would on a garden wall. A great vertical crack appears about two foot long and then in a, in a very slow arc, you know, more or less the full height of the mouth and you get slivers of brickwork, all little pieces of, of all the courses. The thing is that it's got to that stage now where the brickwork's coming away like that and now the cracks are coming in the side of the chimney on their own and it's time to retreat to the fur rate of knots. I backed up away from the chimney and fell down a bloody hole full of water about seven foot deep with the jackhammer over the top of my head like the Burma jungle. And <laughs> how I did it, I do not know. I come out of that hole like a bloody rocket out of a submarine with the jackhammer over the top of my head and the stream of water coming out of my bloody jeans and out of my pants and I hold down the road. I never saw the chimney fall down, but I know summer I dropped the hammer and the, and the horse pipe when I got out the hole. If I'd have demobilised myself when I fell down that hole, there's no way I'd have been here today, you know. When we went back to look at the remains, the bloody air pipe disappeared under the water, down under the brickwork, and just a few bubbles coming up, you know, I'd have been dead there. It would have, it would have near do that, believe me, you know. Um, really, the bigger the chimneys, the better the subject, because they're more predictable what they're going to do. I mean, we, we did one a few... 12 months, 18 months since at the place called Burskall near Southport and, and this was a frightening piece of chimney it was 8 feet diameter but it had two of the biggest flue holes in it at the bottom you've ever seen it were basically two pillars of brickwork about 3 foot wide with two great arches you know which had an hole about 2 foot odd up middle of them you know sort of thing so the brickwork to form the arch went round the circumference of the chimney 
and the, the horrible thing about the wall job were that the, the one row of brand new yuppie houses behind it, the pillar or the brickwork in between the two arches that faced them houses had the biggest bulge on it you've ever seen, you know, it was frightening. And the bricks were like loose. The other side, the side you're going to chisel out, were as solid as a bloody rock, you know, sort of thing. So immediately, you're thinking all the time, you know, if I cut that good brickwork out there, <laughs> will the brickwork with the bulge on hold it up, you know? Will it split on top of the two arches and come down vertically? Will it lean over backwards and fall on the bloody new houses? And to have, make matters worse, the guy who lived in the end house were a Glaswegian psychiatric nurse and semi-mad himself, you know, like the sort of thing. He was frightened to death of getting his new possession, which no doubt he hadn't paid for, damaged in some way by these lunatics fell in this chimney, you see. The thing is that we got it all ready and the usual band of health and safety at workmen and all them were around it. It couldn't have been worse. There were a force nine gale blowing against it. It was pouring down with rain. We couldn't light the fire for about 20 minutes. Eventually, we got the fire going, and, and the iron bar knocked in the crack at the back. There's always, we get this horizontal crack around the back with the iron bar hammered in. And of course, thousand movements on that crack when the thing's lifting up off its bum and going to fall down. The, the bar begins to descend. And in this particular instance, the bar didn't descend. It just kept going up six inches, down six inches, and back up six inches and back down six inches, which means the chimney is actually going as far backwards as the bloody thing's going forwards, you know. And you're wondering all the time, will this brickwork at the back with the big bulging be strong enough to support it? Eventually, the timber succumbed to the pressure and the chimney went down the right way down and everything. And you would never believe the next piece of the vision. The brickwork at the back with the big bulging stayed there, stood up on the floor with a piece of 3x2 with the white lines on and the crowbar just fell down and lying on the floor at the side of it. You could have stood behind the thing, you know, if you'd have been nuts enough or bloody brave enough, but no way, you know, you'd never have believed that. If anybody would have said, oh, that brickwork will stay there, you'd have said you're a raving lunatic, you know, well, I would, you know, uh, and yet it did. My other interest, apart from chimneys and weathercocks and church steeples, is, of course, tracking engines. And I am the proud owner of a steamroller which weighs approximately 14 tonnes. And you can have a lot of fun with a steamroller, but you can also get in a lot of bother. And this is a story about slurring down a big hill and reaching the unbelievable speed of about 40 miles an hour and crashing through a stone wall at the bottom and living to tell the tale about it. Now, there's not many men done this, and I'll try and, and sort of describe exactly what happened to me on this particular fateful day some time ago. It, it starts off, it's rather boring uh, at the beginning, so if you, if you get tired, you can turn it off and turn it on again in a bit. The thing is, I got a job dismantling some magnificent Victorian chimney stacks on... A, a big mansion and on the outskirts of Bolton, you see. And when I got there and I examined these chimney stacks, they turned out to be made out of beautiful blocks of stone, octagonal in shape, about 18 inches across, with a 9-inch hole shot right through the middle. Now, most modern men had have belted them with a big hammer, ordered a skip, thrown the remains in the skip, sent the invoice, get the money and bugger off down the road. I... I'm not such a person. I, I, I hired a trailer that weighed three and a half tons. The grand plan was to save all these beautiful stones, you see. I had this trailer weighed three and a half tons and had no brakes. Now, that in itself is disastrous and rather highly illegal. The thing is, on a Sunday afternoon when there were no cops about, I dragged it across the middle of Bolton with my Land Rover and every time you come to a downer, you know, it were actually shoving the Land Rover you couldn't stop the bugger, and I'll tell you. The thing is, I parked it under a big tree in the grounds of this mansion. And then on Monday, I proceeded to construct an aerial wireway from a telegraph pole, which I'd stuck up on top of a lead flat, on top of the roof of the building. And a wire also 
on a pulley wheel. So by Wednesday-ish, we were lowering the, the stones down the wire onto the trailer. Now, when we got one layer of rock all over this trailer, not knowing the pulling capabilities of a 1910 steamroller, which incidentally isn't really designed as an heavy haulage vehicle, we decided that we'd take the roller and hook it on and see how it performed. Which Saturday morning, we got steam up, went with the steamroller, hooked it on this trailer full of rocks. No trouble at all. You couldn't tell the bloody thing were behind, you know. Even going downhill, there were no marked difference of performance with the engine. So we, we unloaded the rocks at home and took the trailer back for a peak performance Sunday afternoon when there were no cops about with the Land Rover. And then we, we, we decided we'd put two layers of rock on this trailer and when you stood at the arse end of it and looked, the chassis were slightly bent and the tyres were pear-shaped underneath the weight of the rocks that were on. And we've now got two layers of rock on the, on the trailer. And um, the job were coming to an end. And we got a phone call from a very posh restaurant which is situated on top of a mountain outside of Bolton. And the guy at the other end, he said, I believe you've got a lot of stones with holes in, you know. I, I said, yeah. I said, uh, what do you want them for, you know? He said, we want them to put around our restaurant, put daffodils in. He said, how much will you give me? He said, I'll, I'll give you 80 quid for a wagon load. You know, I said, you're on, delivered by steam power. <laughs> and then I thought, you pillock, how are you going to get up this bloody mountain, you know, because the place is literally on top of the mountain. And afterwards, I, I had reservations, you know, but we'd already agreed to do the job, you see. So we had one more chimney stack to take down. So I thought, you know, hell or high water, we'll put the last one in the middle. So the chassis were even more bent. The tyres were pear shaped. It's autumn, pouring down the rain. <clears throat> Every worth two inches deep in dead leaves. We went with the engine on Saturday morning, as usual. <laughs> Hooted on. <laughs> It wouldn't even shift the trailer, you know, both the back wheels are going round and we're not going nowhere, you know, sort of what you might call loss of traction. We borrowed a dustbin, scattered a few ashes and it got a grip and we got outside onto the main road. And you can definitely tell with the extra load of rock that it, 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 it were about to pick its feet up, you know, it were about to be like a locomotive with 40 wagons of coal on back when it didn't want to go, you know. The thing is, we made it back to our house on the Saturday afternoon, and then I had a fairly sleepless night wondering and worrying as to how we would go on going up this mountain on Sunday. It rained heavily all night long, still raining Sunday morning, reluctantly lit the fire in the engine, and, and we, we set off. The first hill out of Bolton is equally as steep as what the, the mountain is, and I got everything ready and my speech ready and everything to say the blocks of wood are under the trailer, the red lamps are on and we'll come back on Monday or when it stops raining, you see. But it didn't. It went up the first hill. No silver streaks on the wheels. You can tell when a steamroller is going to pick its feet up. If you keep looking at the driving wheel, the silver streaks will appear on the edge of it when it's going to go from woof, 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 woof into bum, 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 and the wheel's going round and you're going backwards down the bloody hill, you see. The thing is that no silver streaks to all. for the rest of the journey there's one or two inundations but nothing terrible you know and then we come to it it's a right hand turn 45 degrees and it's called hospital brew <laughs> i looked up this hill and prayed to him upstairs in heaven and steamrollers have two gears slow and bloody slow two speeds slow and bloody slow we put it in the bottom gear shoved the handle forward, opened the regulator and woof, 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 all the way up the mountain, burned all the paint off the funnel, but we got there, we're there, we're safe, highly elated, you know, we've got about 25 tonne of rocks on a, on a trailer that has no brakes to the top of a mountain, um, in them days it weren't quite as posh as what it is now, this restaurant, and the back, the car park were just ballast and muck and general, you know, it were flat, that's about all you could say for it. The thing is, the man who owned it at that time had a compound for all his building material, you see, so we steamed the whole lot into this compound and then spent about the next two and a half hours rolling these rocks down a big bark of timber so we didn't damage them and, and we'd got the money, I wouldn't have cared what, what happened next if we could have got drunk, it were in the days when pubs shut at three o'clock, you see. 
We've got rid of the rocks, we've got the 80 quid, we've got three stolen road lamps on the arse end of the trailer, we've got 300 way to call, a grand plan now, we're running light engine, there's, how can we get in trouble, you know, no way. Uh, is have a pint here and a pint there, aren't we home, you see, and the end of a perfect day. Now I've got to diversify here a bit and explain to you that, 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 that describe the road layouts in this place. Basically it's one road that comes uphill from the main highway outside to the restaurant and you go round the back onto the car park and when you've done what you're doing up there you come you come out of the car park and you come down a one-way street if it want of a word that meets the main entrance road at an approximate angle of 45 degrees where there is a cattle grid a five-barred gate a gas lamp a flagpole and various half beer barrels full of shrubs it's like a general junction and the ladder is with me He's 18 years old and he's doing the steering and I'm working the handles, in other words, I am the driver, he's only the guy who makes it go in the right direction. The man from the restaurant in his pinstripe suit stood on the trailer at the back, he'd never had a ride on a steamroller before, so he thought he were coming to wave us off at the gate, you see. And we come off the car park onto this slip road, a, a sort of one-way street for one to a word, which is a fur incline, but the the the... the the thing is, we set off, and with a traction engine or a road roller, you can always tell when you're exceeding its designed road speed, because the crankshaft starts to whip, which of course gives the edge of the flywheel an unbelievable waddle, and as though the bloody crankshaft's going to break in half, you see, and, and it's time to slow the proceedings down at, at this, this moment in time, which steamrollers have no real brakes for a start, the modus operandi for slowing them down is to put the thing in reverse like Casey Jones when they've blown up the bridge, you know, with a locomotive. So we're going down the hill and the revs are building up fast. Young Webber's doing his best with the steering. This engine, for us mechanically minded, has no differential gear, so both pins are in the back wheels, which means that when you come to a bend, the steering is very inactive. It don't want to go around a bend. Now, we are now going down this hill and we're doing about 10 miles an hour, which is twice the design speed for the engine. I've realised that there's something terribly wrong, you know, I've not quite worked out what's what. We'd, we'd, we'd got the, the, what nearly always happens with the braking system on the, the machine is, it's a bloody great cast iron drum on the back axle, which is liberally lubricated by the oil off the gearing which when you start to screw on the brakes, nothing happens until you run over a pebble. And soon as the road wheel lifts off the road and hits the deck again, the bloody brakes are on. And it is no longer a vehicle, it is a sledge. A 14 ton sledge going down a bloody mountain. So you might as well forget the brakes, don't bother with them. It's, got, it's going to fast now for brakes. So, what we've got to do is crash it in reverse and open the regulator full bore. By this time we're now doing 20 miles an hour. Webber's still doing his best on the steering. I put it in full reverse and full throttle open. The bloody wheels are going backwards and we're accelerating down the mountain. Now, you can forget braking. What we've got to do is find some way of slowing it down a bit. Now, if we try for the 45 degree bend at the bottom with both pins in and no differential gear, the engine is going to enter the field with full lock on at the front and there's no way it's going to go round. And then, to God for it, make matters even worse. There's a three foot drop off the edge of the main entrance road to the restaurant. Then a steamroller entering a wet field at speed is like a bar of soap on a wet sink. You cannot predict which way the bastard's going to go. The field that we're going to go in is about 60 foot wide and then there's a 15 foot drop into the back of a geriatric hospital. And I have visions in my head of a dead old ladies and twisted and bloody national health bedsteads and all of that. Anyway, there's one bit that I've sort of omitted to mention at this road junction, which is a large stone pillar, two foot thick by four foot wide with a four inch steam pipe down the bloody middle of it. And I'm thinking all the time in my mind's racing round, that it's got to be a racehorse mixture, ten of sand and one of cement. You know, I mean, the whole place were brand new, even though it represented all the worldly charm and all that. The thing is, hit the pillar, fur and square, without any steering. So I issued orders to Weber to steer for the pillar, you see. And we hit the pillar, easily doing 30 miles an hour. And the, the, 
the pillar, the scraper on the front of the roller, which is a piece of three eighths by three eighths by two and a half inch angle iron, it actually flattened that out to a to a flat bloody five inch wide iron bar. <laughs> the thing is, the pillar, the top half of it above the front of the radius of the rollers, set off for heaven in a million pieces with the with the steam pipe and the no entry sign. Like, like a lollipop stick flying towards heaven about 60 foot up in the sky it was the rocks are going in every direction but it didn't stop the engine the engine mounted the stump of the pillar and was slurring along at 45 degrees like Concord taking off whereupon when the rear wheels and the ash pen ash pan arrived at the, at the stump of the pillar which must have had an extra bag of cement in it it weren't racehorse mixture like I thought the, the, it finally mounted the stump of the pillar with the underside of the firebox and paused for a second or two in mid-air. Weber had disappeared over the side somewhere. <laughs> God knows where he was. And it's amazing at times like this so you have time to think. I thought, bloody hell, you know, if only it were a traction engine. Because when it lands, a traction engine is basically made of steel and iron and not cast iron. Cast iron, of course, is a very brittle material. You cannot drop the best part of seven tonnes of cast iron from ten feet up in the sky and expect it to stay in one piece. I didn't have to wait long. Down come the front of the engine, it hit the deck, the front forks broke into three pieces, the boiler dug an hole in the road eighteen inches deep, it's got a raging fire in its belly and the arse end of it's on top of a pillar that's two foot high. This is not the recommended handle to park a steamroller at, you know. Yeah, after the initial impact and the shock, young Weber come crawling out from underneath. How the hell he survived, I'll never know. And then another terrible thing struck my mind. The fact that the rollers, which weigh approximately two tonnes, are on one single chain it is that's lapped round a drum which of course when you turn it one way anti-clockwise and clockwise it has the effect of turning the front forks and, and all the, the, to get round corners the thing is that these chains are very old and quite quite brittle and the fact that we did anneal them about 25 years ago by just lighting a big fire with sticks and throwing them in possibly saved the day because if them chains had departed what were left of the front forks of the rollers, which amounts to say some three tonne or two and a half tonnes of iron, would have been away across the bloody field and it would have gone straight through this old folks home, like there'd been some sort of reenaction of the dam busters, you know, sort of style. <laughs> but the chains didn't break and God were good to us that day, you know. Number one, we've got to get the fire out quick before the bloody thing blows up. So we've only brought the short shovel, being, being near to home, we didn't anticipate any clinkering activities, so we've only got a little shovel that we put coal on with, and it's the only bloody tool we've got to get rid of as much of the fire as we can. So with the, with the fire all door open and the flames coming out burning my wedding gear, I'm, and the only way you could stand up was stood on the axle boxes, because the footplate were too steep, you know, the handle we were lying at. The flames are coming out, the tarmac's on fire, and I'm chucking the bloody red-hot flames everywhere over the side of the ship, you see. A small crowd had gathered by this time. And in the crowd, it's drizzling with rain, it's nearly dark. There's one guy with a camera, David Bailey, he's never seen a steamroller accident before, so he's doing his best, a, a million flicks a minute, like. And another guy stood in the background, rather thoughtful-looking fellow with a trilby on, come over, and he said... My lad's got a breakdown wagon, would you like me to give him a ring? <laughs> and I said, well, I can laugh now, I didn't then. The thing is, I said, well, do you think it'll lift it up? You know, and, and he said, uh, yeah, he said, I think so. So he disappeared into the gloom and the rest of the onlookers wandered round with a woe is me and all the rest of it. David Bailey kept on taking his pictures and I'm looking out where I can get a new pair of front forks and, and it, I knew it instantly were, were the whistle. There were actually two per in, in Dewsbury in Yorkshire leaning against a wall in an old steamroller proprietor's yard. Which, cut a long story short, for £75 I got the forks. For 15 quid I got them down the M62 on the back of a wagon. The three telegraph poles and a pair of two ton chain blocks, and by the following Wednesday it were back on its wheels again. Now every day, this little lad come, 
with his paper bag on his back to, to see how progress were being made in this repair of this busted steam engine, you see. I never had the, you know, I was so upset and, and bad-tempered that I never spoke to him in all the days from, like, Monday morning till, till Wednesday. And on Wednesday, I condescended to speak to him and I said, did you see this disaster cock? And he said, yeah. He said, you know that horse on the front, he said. He said, I've got its head, I've got its tail, and I've got all its four legs. But he said the torso bit of it was still screwed on the front of the engine. Yeah, the horse on the front is, is uh, actually the rampant horse of Kent, which is Thomas Aveling's trademark for, you know, the insignia on front of all his steamrollers that he ever made, you know. And I said, did you, he said, he said, oh, me and me dad, he said, we're having our tea, we live over there in that end house, he said. And he said, me dad said, bloody hell, he said, that's going fast for a steamroller. And then he said, bang, and he said, there were all these red hot cinders. He said, do you not remember seeing me here? He said, I, 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 you know, it was raining, weren't it? I said, yeah, I know that. He said, do you remember the man with the camera? He said, yeah, he said, that's Mr. Brown, he lives over there, that one with the boat up the drive. So I said... <laughs> I'll tell you what, mate, I'll get you the rest of this horse off the front of the engine if you'll go and ask Mr. Brown if I can borrow his negatives of the film he took when he were, when he were here filming the engine in this terrible state. And away he went over the field, and he come back, he said, Saturday morning, he'll have the photographs, he'll give you the negatives, I give him the horse, and he trotted along, we steamed it round the car park, see that now we're bent, and we let the fire go out. On Saturday morning, with a bright and early, the fire's lit. I didn't want to upset Mr. Brown's egg and bacon, so I left it till about quarter to nine before I wandered over the field, <laughs> wandered up his drive, knocked on his front door, and all as I can say, he came to the front door and he looked like there'd been a bereavement in the family or something like that. You know, I said to him, I'm the man in the field with the steam engine. He said, aye, he said, I'm the silly bastard who forgot to take the lens cap off the camera. <laughs> Full, full roll of film with ends screwed on, you know, you know, the excitement. <laughs> now we're at the end, of just a bad memory now, you know. Uh, yeah, on another occasion, we, like as a rule, you can, you can control these things. Like now, I'm more experienced. And in fact, just this last 12 months, down in the southern counties of England, there, there's been a fatality with, through sheer panic of losing the engine, and, and I often wonder why, if you look at the licences for traction engines and steamrollers, you're allowed to drive a traction engine with a car licence, but not a steamroller. And, and it's very, very wise, really, because the steamroller is a much more dangerous beast than a, than a traction engine. Even a traction engine with strikes on will slide to a certain extent. But on tarmac, you do get a grip, and of course with rubber tyres on, you've, you've no chance of slurring. You know, they're only doing like top speed, like bloody 20 mile an hour, a, a bigger, you know, they'll go fast. The thing is, the a roller can lose its feet under terrible different conditions, like hitting a manhole cover with the wheel that's actually doing the driving can cause it to just stop in the middle of the road and the wheel go round and round and round. I mean, I've been driving my steamroller totally alone, with the living van on the bike, uphill, behind a convoy of traffic, and the traffic lights have changed further up, and you are creeping up to a car, the, the tail end of a car, which which you stopped in the queue of traffic, and you've let with the back wheel on a manhole cover, and you can't set off. It, the wheel is in between the little protrusions on the cast iron manhole cover, and it's revolving, and grind, it's machine in two grooves in the steel wheel. And what you've got to do is, because the engine has no diff and you're only being driven by that wheel that's going round, the other wheel stopped on the pavement side, you've got to... I'll never forget on one occasion when, it, when this happened to me, and right across the road there were a bus stop full of people. And they could not weigh up at what I'd done, you know, like they looked at the vision and the wheel's going round and I'm on the footplate. And, and how's he going to get out of that one? Because they couldn't see the other wheel on the other side. And they thought I were goosed. They wouldn't, wouldn't go any further slowed the thing down to a, just a crawling pace and then jump off into the gutter and wait for one of the holes coming round in the other, in this case it's the brake drum on keyed to the axle which is being driven 
and as soon as you come to one of the six holes, gong, in goes the pin and you're away. And the engine sets off on its own with no driver up the hill, you see. And you then hop on and get all of the controls again, which makes it look unbelievably dangerous. I mean, it is dangerous in a way. The, the thing is, on this particular occasion, it were the descent of a mountain backwards with the living van on the back, which, you know, the, the whole thing doesn't like going backwards in a straight line, if you follow me. I mean, and the thing is, we'd... we'd We'd just reached the top of a, of a very long hill in Derbyshire, in the Peak Forest, with the, the, the new girlfriend, and me, and, and a young lad who, who we'd just latched onto, in a way, a, sort of a, a lad called Joe, who, who made friends with us at traction engine rallies. And um, no relation whatsoever, you see. And, of course, we're nearing the top of the hill, and it's a left-hand bend, with the camber of the road, of course, into the corner of the bend. And the wheel that's driving the engine is on the crown of the road. And the road were frequently passed by uh, ballast wagons from the quarries in Derbyshire. So there's a light sprinkling of, of, of I'd say, three-eighths, you know, limestone chippings on the road that, that, of course, caused the wheel to lift up a bit. And we're almost there. The road is now levelling out. The main mountain we'd succumbed as usual, you know. And we're going round the left-hand bend and there without any warning, like a Black 5 locomotive with 40 wagons of coal behind it, it just opened up, you know, roaring, you know. Bah, 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 the whole engine's bouncing, you know, sort of thing. And, of course, the, the what I should have done, I realise now, but, but I didn't do it, I should have closed the regulator which would have stopped the wheel revolving and then I could have jumped off into the gutter and of course soon as that wheel stopped and going at the, the speed that the thing were going backwards down the hill with in would have gone the pin but I didn't, I didn't think, I jumped off and the wheel on the crown of the road's accelerating and I'm trying to shove the pin in a wheel that's revolving in the opposite direction it just will not go in. The holes are going faster past. You cannot get it in. And the whole thing started going down the hill with the new girlfriend on screaming. The, the whole thing, the, 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 the living van behind weighing about two tons is now jackknifing in the road. Good job there were no traffic behind us. The living van ended up at 90 degrees to the engine. We're about the outside corner of the cab with the first two at the corner of the living van, then that shoved it right round and the near side corner of the van at the other end of the living van, and thereupon it turned it over, almost facing the way it had come, onto a dry stone wall on top of this mountain, and the engine finally come to a stop, mainly through Sue having the, the brains enough to shut the regulator and screw on the flywheel brake, you know. Now, what would have saved that situation, without a shadow of a doubt, were just one block of wood underneath the back wheel. And it would have had it, you know, that we hadn't got one. I have one everywhere I go now, on every occasion. Even, it doesn't matter if it's 30 miles flat, you know, it's hanging there at the side of that wheel with no, with no pin in it, you know. If you put the pin in, like the, 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 the recommending now, the health and safety people, that you drive everywhere with both pins in. But when you come to a bend, you can't get the damn thing round the bend, you know, sort of thing. It's bad news. And the, the thing is, you know, there was nothing very funny about that. It, it could have been fatal, you know, sort of thing. Um, you know, buggered up the roof of the canopy on the engine and the living van, we ended up having reboard both sides of it. Because one side landed on the wall, <coughs> the other side had about 18 inches of boarding inwards from each end damaged and there were no it was you know you might as well reboard the whole thing the funny bit were drawing lots as to who should open the door and have a look at the state of affairs inside you see because when the old timers used to do it which they did quite a lot there's lots and lots of pictures of the living van upside down and the grand explanation would be broken jam pots and cinders all mixed up together, you know, and all the tea and sugar all mixed up, all everything, bedding and everything all. And it was just like that. I can see it now. The lace curtains hanging off the side downwards, the stovepipe going across horizontally. 
all the cinders and the all the lids off the stove and the doors open and all the cinders all over the floor. If we'd have had a fire in the stove that day, which you quite frequently do, have the fire lit driving along, um, we wouldn't have had a living van. It would have set fire to the living van on top of the mountain and there would be no water there. We, we couldn't have put it out, you know, it would have been a goner, you know. Not very many moments after, a bloke pulled up in a Mercedes and, and he said, I've got some recovery vehicles, you know, do you want me to come and, you know, straighten it up for you? And, and he went away down the mountain and come back with a, a blooming great digging machine and immense power, you know, and we chained the van and, and sort of pulled it up back on its wheels. And at the bottom of the hill there were a pub <laughs> and we took it all back down and parked it on the pub car park. Uh, all in a terribly bent state, the drawbar were like a snake, and um, the, the landlord at the pub had been a joiner, and he, he gave us permission to leave it in his car park while we got m repairs materials back from base, and we spent next week repairing it, you know, uh, two new sides, and all the heavy stuff that had been damaged, when we went away, like, I, I were okay for leaving them, it were only superficial damage, it weren't, it weren't anything that interfered with its running. When the pub was shut, this man had got his joinering set out, which he'd never forsaken, and, and repaired all the all the nasty bits in a very, very highly skilled manner, you know, they were really well done. In fact, you couldn't tell they'd been broken, you know, when they were painted. In fact, you still can't, you know, it's many years ago. And, uh, you know, that was the end of it. Then we put it back together and put both pins in and went up the bloody mountain, no trouble, you know, and, ultimately and eventually ended up at Chatsworth and that was the end of that like <laughs> yeah the steamroller like I say you can have a lot of fun with it and on this particular occasion um, we, we, we were going on a two day journey which of course necessitated an overnight stay on some public house car park which was somewhere on the outskirts of Manchester we finished breakfast off and by 8.30 steam's up so we're on the way and we're going along and we've had nothing to eat all day and it's now coming up to 1.30 and we passed one of them shops that have got big glass cases in windows with pies in with light shining on them make them look better and they the pulled up the engine sent one of the lads back to the pie shop who come back with three of these pies and we sat on the board in between the on the drawbar in between the the engine and the and the van. We we are sat there in the lay-by eating the pies, minding our own business, you know. And I mean, it's a fairly busy road. Uh, it's Hazel Grove actually coming out to Stockport and um, well up into country sort of thing, uh, you know, getting on towards like New Mills Way that road on and. Uh, we well, you know, nice and happy, lovely Sunday afternoon, and this guy's coming along in a big swanky Rover car, doing about 60, and he decides he'll do some mobile photography. He's, so the passenger's got the camera by this time. He's got the brakes on, but the fellow behind, he didn't, he weren't doing any photography, he just wanted to get home for his lunch, no doubt. Bush into the back of it, you know, and then the bloke behind that, he actually crashed into the back of that. And then I think there were a squeal or two further on, you know, like, well, and you're waiting for another one, but... We only had three in a row, broken bloody rear lamps and reflectors and chrome strips and everything all over it, Rob. <laughs> we have another munch of the pie, you know, sort of thing. And after a bit of shouting at each other, they decided that they would move, like they do, half on the pavement, half in the road, to sort out the paperwork. The pies have now gone. Quick flirt round with the oil cam. We steam out of the, the lay-by, running over all these chrome strips and bits of headlamps. <laughs> they all stopped what they were doing, and as we passed, they waved to us. You know, I could never understand the logic of that. You know, like, We must have done, indirectly, it was really our fault, but we were the distraction in a way. We must have done about 5,000 quids worth of bloody damage to them three cars, and they were all waving, you know, and that were it. Yeah, the, the, back to the chimneys in a way, this, uh, when it's cold and frosty, you know, and you've got to climb up a 200 foot chimney, it's not very funny, you know, so, you know, like I say, there's not a lot of funny happens. And on this particular morning, it was high winter, as you might say, and frost everywhere, 
and we've got this 200 foot chimney and we've got ladders up each side of it and it's exceedingly cool and we reluctantly arrive on the job in the morning you see and um, my old mate Donald and I and we wandered round bottom at chimney like and sat on the pecking in between the ladder and the wall of the chimney you know you need it, the ladders are packed off the wall of the chimney so room for your boots you see the thing is there's a ginger tomcat sat on this packing about 16 feet up from the floor now I said to Donald I'll go and get the tomcat so I approached the ladder and not wishing to upset this tomcat so get it a bit worried I, I decided I would go very slow you see so as my first foot went two rungs up the, on the bottom ladder the bloody cat moved up two rungs on the second ladder and as I went up the bottom ladder the cat moved up the second ladder so the cat went time I got to the top of the bottom ladder which is only 16 feet long the cat is now 32 feet up in the sky and I'm thinking, if it keeps on doing this, we're going to be in a bit of bother. So just let it be there. It's freezing cold. I don't really want to go up the bloody chimney anyway. So we come down and decided we'd have a cup of tea. So we had a cup of tea and another look at it. And um, then I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll go and see the, the manager and ask him if he will ring the fire brigade. And we'll have another hour or two watching the fun watching the fire brigade rescue the cat. So I trotted off to the office, and of course it's just like Bradley Hardacre, you know, in brass, very uh, walnut fittings and all that, and he sat behind his desk, and he gave me a long, glancing sort of look, and uh, I said, we've got a problem, Mr Ewins, he were called. He's dead now, it killed him, this uh, encounter. The, the thing he had angina, you see, didn't do him no good, the excitement. <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> put a bugger. I said, we have a problem, we've got this cat part way up the chimney, and I said, when I try and go for it, as I climb up, it goes further, you see. I said, what I want you to do is ring fire brigade, and of course the cotton industry is not doing very well in Lancashire, so money is of great importance and, and tight, as you might say. So his answer to that was, oh no, he said, he said, if we ring the fire brigade, they'll send us a bill. And this next bit struck me as being very funny. He said, if we ring the RSPCA, they have an arrangement with the fire brigade and they'll come for notes. <laughs> so he said, he rang his lady on the door, uh, on the, the exchange downstairs, and he said, ring, ring the RSPCA, we've got this cat stuck up chimney. Do you want a cup of tea? So we had a cup of tea and a talk about the great days of cotton mills being driven by 2,000 horsepower steam engines and fired on coal and uh, when they made a fortune and then we decided after the tea that we'd go out and have a look what the situation were outdoors you see so oh woe is me we went outside there's an RSPCA van there and a man in a black overcoat I don't know why they've always got a black overcoat black, o black overcoat with pips up and the cat's about 80 odd foot up the chimney. The man from the RSPCA stood there with this like cat strandler. It's like a piece of conduit piping with a piece of wire threaded up the middle of it. It comes out the top and then it's tied back around the top of the pipe. And the wire sticking out the other end has like an angle on it. So the idea is you put this over the irate animal's head and pull the bloody string at the other end and you've got it by the wasp. It's like... Uh, it struck me, how the hell were he going to work that for a start off a, off a vertical ladder, holding on, possibly with one hand, without any sort of training on how to act on a vertical ladder, you know. Anyway, I said to Donald, what, what happened? How has it ended up up there? He said, well, this guy here said, when it were 30 foot up, no problem, you know. He said, I'll go and get it, you know. So he set off up the ladder, and as he got to the top of the, the bottom ladder, the cat would already on its way up the third ladder, and he kept on and on going, and of course, the secret, what he should have run, he should have run up the ladders, like I, I realised this after, and there's no way the cat could have beat him, you know, he'd eventually caught up with it before it got so high up. The thing is, when he got to 50 feet up, 
that's the RSPCA man, his bottle went, you see, and he decided he wouldn't bother anymore, he'd come down, you see, so he said all sorts of embarrassing things like, when it, tonight, when it gets fed up, it'll come down on its own and all of that, like, and I said, hang on a bit, you know, I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. I said, I'll go up the other ladder on the other side and get on top of the chimney, and on the top of the chimney, there's a layer of soot, which is the consistency of the crust on a loaf of bread, with the rain dashing at it and the heat baking it. It's, it's, you can break it up in big slams. And I'll drop it down on the cat, and it'll get fed up with this and go into retreat, you see. Well, it's had exactly the opposite effect. It must have thought, there's life up there, and I shall continue. So the, the cat, I'm sat 200 feet up in the sky, slowly being asphyxiated by the bloody smoke coming out of the top. I can see the cat giving it this in between the rungs of the ladder. I can see red disappeared, red disappeared, red disappeared. It's going in and out at rungs. Six foot from the top of the chimney, there's a sailing course round, which is protruding out from the face of the brick about four and a half inches flat and then about a, a, a 12 inch radius, you know, so there's not really enough for a man to walk on, but a fair amount of room for a cat. The cat is on the ledge. It did not resemble a cat no more. Its tail were about five inches diameter. It were walking backwards and making funny noises. Now, I can't walk on a ledge four and a half inches diameter, 200 feet in the sky. If I'd have had a brush steel, I could have flicked the bastard off before the refers got to the state that they did do, but I hadn't got a brush steel. I could only say hello to it. I couldn't get at it. <laughs> and it's on the ledge. By this time, the RSPCA had sent out messages. They had a big net round the bottom, not for me, for the bloody cats in case it fell off. The fire brigade had arrived and said, we haven't got a ladder long enough, get up there. <laughs> BBC television had come all the way from Manchester. ITV had come as well. So there were two rival television teams at the bottom. Every cat lover in bloody Bolton were round the bottom and the cat just was on the ledge. So dinner time is fast approaching, so down the ladder, slightly black with the smoke coming out of the top. And he come out with a classic then, the RSPCA man, he said, I've got it. He said, the solution for the problem is, we'll get my cat box after lunch and we'll tie four pieces of string on it and we'll put two tins of kitty cat in it, open, nice brains for you, open, and then you can sit on top of the chimney and lower down the cat box and this cat will smell the meat and it'll jump in the box. Simple stuff. Didn't work. All afternoon, up and down with the bloody basket with the meat in, this cat has more on its mind than food. It's called fear and preservation. It didn't want to know. All afternoon, <laughs> then, down the ladder again, tea time. he come out with another. He said, tonight when it goes dark, it'll get fed up and come down on its own. It rained heavily all night long. The only difference in the morning, it were a black one instead of a red one. I thought, today, I am not going to let anybody tell me what to do. I'm going to put the platform up. That'll put me and the pussycat on more of an equal footing because the first platform, we're going just underneath this sailing course that the cat is on. Looked very beraddled. I'm in my bosun's chair with my hammer and my chisel chopping the holes in for the staging. We got half the staging up, all the television people are back, the cat lovers of the world are back, the nets are back in position. And some of them are they've always got a black overcoat. Down at lunchtime, BBC went to one pub, ITV went to another, and a bloke come out of the crowd, he said, we have a man here who specialises in rescuing cats in high places. Ewan's with her, he's screaming and shouting, he's the manager, he's screaming and shouting, we don't want no heroes, he's the only man who's going up that chimney, you know, and that's it, like, and everybody's falling out with each other. Me and Donald went home for lunch, and I've been looking at chimneys ever since I was a little lad, and I can spot a man on the side of a chimney two miles away. We had lunch, and at one o'clock, reconvened, and we're coming over the motorway bridge, and you can see this particular chimney. In fact, even today, it is one of the few left in that area and there's a lump on the side of it and I says to Donald there's somebody up the chimney you know some definitely somebody up the right on stack of ladders you know 
We're steamed into the mill yard. All hell's let loose. Ewins is shouting. The Black Mariah's there. The ambulance is there. The fire brigade are there. The cops are in. <laughs> Everybody's arguing the toss. The man's got the cats, but he's knackered. He's holding on with one hand. And the cat's giving wild gesticulations. Arms and legs are going in and out. And nobody really knows what to do about anything. So I said, I'll go up and have a word with him and see how he's doing. And give him a few lessons on how to hook yourself on the ladder with your legs, you see. And then if he wants, he can strangle the bloody cat with his other hand. Anyway, I get up near him, you see, and he got to have come from Cheshire because he had one of them linseed oil jackets and green wellies. You know, like there's nobody has them round our old. You think it? I had a look at him and the next spectacle were unbelievable because, you know, the clean air act and all that's a load of rubbish, you know, like sort of oil boilers and combustion in general from big industrial boilers. You can't see any smoke coming out like you did in the olden days when it used to come out like black treacle through uneconomical coal firing. Basically, it were only carbon and it rotted lace curtains away and filled everybody's gutters up with ash and dirt but it didn't really do you a lot of harm you know you could actually breathe it and you could you could walk about in it but modern boilers and modern combustion is bloody horrible you know like you've been on the air the night before you're down on your knees bloody reaching and it also destroys all your sinuses you know your nose runs profusely and you cannot stop it you know it's just one continuous watery bloody extrusion out of your nose and this guy had evidently been on top of the chimney in the smoke and, and he'd never you know done it before and in his his you know efforts to get the cat the smoke had got at him and when i said to him hey all right he turned round and he had two magnificent candles out of his nose that had a light covering of soot on that he looked like fu manchu they went right round and down under his chin and down his neck <laughs> i couldn't believe it and he said, yeah, he said, yeah, I'm all right. I said, I said, well, I've never seen a bloody cat with bigger claws. They were sticking out like bloody three quarters of an inch long. If they'd gone anywhere near him, they'd have gone straight through his claws and he'd have never got it off. He wouldn't have need to hold it. He could have carried it down without bloody holding it. <laughs> the thing is, I said, I'll go down and get the cat box and tie it on the rope. And I said, it's blowing now, isn't it? A force ten had got up like, you know, and... If, it, if I pull it up, it's a plastic thing, it's got to go out into space, come back and hit the side of the chimney and be in a thousand pieces, you know, so I'll have to go down, tie it on, and then I'll come back up with it, and then so you can still, if you look between your legs and do what I do with my legs, you'll be able to leave go and get a bit of rest in your other arm, you see. I'll go down and get the box after I'd hooked him on safe, Come back up with it, I'll pull the pin out and open the lid. You shove the cat in the box, I'll shut the lid and put the pin in, and then we'll send it down to Terra Firma and we've won, everything's over with. Okay, so down the ladder, back up again, open the lid, shove the cat in, load the cat down, all the newspaper men appeared and the television men, pull the pin out, they got the cat out, they must have been the most photographed cat in Western Europe, it made the six o'clock news on, on BBC. <laughs> When he come down, they arrested him. <laughs> I never saw him again. They threw him in the bloody van and carted him away, you know. And poor bugger. He was like the hero of the day and he got arrested. I don't, I don't know who he, who he is to this day. I never saw him again. Yeah. Yeah, when I want to join her before I went insane and started climbing up chimneys, uh, <laughs> some of the guys that I work with on that score, like the, one particular fella... He, he, called Bill Gillibrand, you know, he had a bit of a drink problem, you know, he was, he was always drunk when he had money, or when he had a win on the horses, um, but what a joiner, you know, he was brilliant, all he had were a, a saw, an axe, one chisel, and, a, and an hammer, and, and he could work wonders with that, the saw had been sharpened so many times, it went down to like a, a pencil point at the end, and he could give it, come to going round the fancy Cornish mould in an house or something. He, he could cut it better than modern man could with a jigsaw, you know. He, he were a genius, um, you know. But some of the things he got up to, you know, like, you're always trying to get me in the pub when I was 15. Um, one thing that sprung to light were, not springs to mind, were we'd been doing one job on one side of town and, and we'd got to go to the cemetery, 
and put some spouts up round the chapel. And of course, he, he must have just had a win on the ice, so he rung a taxi. And I can remember getting in this taxi with the saw blocks and the paint pots and all the bits and pieces. And then we drove down past where we past his local pub. And of course, he'd engineered it cunningly, so we arrived at the pub at dinner time. So he stopped the taxi at the pub, you see, piled out the pub, left the saw block outside the pub door and the toolboxes and all. People were more honest in them days, you know, nobody had run off with it, you know, especially a bloke's tools, and um, into the pub. And we paid there. And I said, look, I'm going back, you know, I'm going into the park for, you know, the boss will be here with the wages. And to get to this cemetery, you've got to go into the park and walk around over a bridge, over a river. And I'm nearly there, I'm nearly back in the cemetery, uh, where the job we're going on, though we've got a report to. And he's on the other side of the river, which is about 25 foot wide and 3 foot deep. And he's coming up, and he's, I can see him now, <laughs> and he's black overcoat with a racing paper sticking out the pocket. Hopelessly drunk, you know, and he's walking up the side, I said, how in the bloody hell are you going to get across the river? Don't worry, he said, I'll show you. And he just turned sharp right, put douche in it, up to his chest, walked straight across the river and out it to the side. He worked all afternoon, wet through like that, you know, bloody crackers. Yeah, the, the world of steeplejacks, were, they were very odd people, you know. Some of them didn't seem to wash a lot, you know. They always, they always smelled of boiled linseed oil and soot. And they had trousers that, like, stood up on their own, you know. That, that was the fact that... The most of the pointing work that they did were done with a substance called mastic, which is basically a mixture of everything lethal. It's, it's clean, washed, dry river sand. That's the only nice stuff. Mixed with plumber's whiting, what they make putty out of. Red lead, which is highly toxic. <laughs> Um, and litharge, which is also a byproduct of lead, which is toxic. All mixed up together in a paste with boiling seed oil. And, of course, this boiled linseed oil ended up all over them. And, of course, the soot stuck to that. So they wore clothing that resembled uh, motorcyclist leathers, you know, like, covered with this stuff. And I, I really served my time with these people because I used to go mithering them, you know, and they used to tell me, them that could, they weren't all capable, explain, you know, how they did it. And I remember trying to ask them, how much money they got as a wage for doing well, and I were quite impolitely told to do things like piss off, we're not telling you, you know, and things like that. Um, really, really strange people. But they always amazed me, how they, and they nearly always had berets on. Look, they, they, they were like left over from last war, and, uh, and all, but they were masterful men who, who could put these ladders up and these platforms around top of these great 200 foot chimneys, single handed, you know, um, and didn't seem to have any fear in them at all, you know. I think some of them, like, they, they basically lived for tea time and the alehouse, you know. They didn't even take the trowels home, you know, when I used to go climbing up the chimneys in the dark when they'd gone home and sniffing around, I, I can see the visions now in the almost pitch blackness shiny trowels, always shiny, you know, because they didn't bother with sand and cement like bricklayers. And this linseed oil business, it kept them in really good nick. And you can see them all stuck under the lashings that held the planks down, you know, trowels, you know, shining in the moonlight sort of thing. And the smell of sulphur coming out the top of the chimney where they burn coal, you know. The vision as a kid, it's... It, it's very sad to me, you know, it's all gone, you know, I mean, it might be nice and healthy to the Joe public in general, but uh, you've got to face the facts when all that were going on, we led the world, you know, we're at the bottom of the bloody barrel now. In the days when we got fogs, you know, like sort of, the, you know, when all the chimneys smoked and all that, <clears throat> you don't get them now at all. The nearest experience you can have to what I'm going to try and explain to you is being in an aeroplane above the clouds. In the old days, when I first started, you got, like, visibility on floor a few hundred yards and very muggy and all, and, and not very nice. And then all this fluff above, and every now and again it'd move a bit, and you'd see blue sky above, you know, sort of thing. And this chimney was 270 feet high. It was one of the biggest chimneys in Bolton. 
and I am taking off the top half by hand on this scaffold at, at the top that comes down with the chimney. The man who's assisting me on the floor, my labourer, is 70 odd year old and all he's got to do is keep anybody out of way or wandering into our dropping zone which we have roped off with, with bloody rope all round. Plenty of room, a football pitch to get this bricks in. So there's no problem with people or anything. There's a big fence along the road, nobody can come through the fence, the gates are locked. The big rope all the way around. And I depart upwards and it's beautiful. Cotton wool everywhere, you know. I can see the odd chimney all over, different bits of town sticking up, like sort of thing. And I'm, of course, concentrating on the job, you see. And I'm, I don't know, I must have gone round about four times at, at about three bricks deep, nine inches deep. The wall was about 18 inches thick. And these bricks were nori, that's, that's iron spelt backwards, you know. And when it were visibility were good, there were a manhole cover down below that somebody had nicked, and it were covered with a piece of quarter plate. And these bricks are so hard that you could throw them from the top of this 270 foot, and if you hit this manhole cover where it were hollow and near to the edge, it, it, it ripped a bloody L-shaped tear in it, you know, just for fun this, you know, trying to hit the manhole cover, you know. And I've gone round and I'm holding these bricks into the cotton wool. And round the top of the chimney, there are eight ladders, all brand new, all painted on the same day. And the lightning conductors have gone for the beer money. So there's no compass points on this chimney, you know, hardly. And I'm going round and you're pissed off, you know, you're bloody soul destroying, you know. All on your own and it's about 15 foot diameter. You know, and they're round and round in the, in the fog. Well, in the sun and the, the fluff down below. And I threw this one, and it, like, even with all the fluff and the fog, you could hear them landing, you know. I wouldn't be able to hear them now, but I could hear them then, you know. And, uh, boom, you know, boom. And I threw this one, because you, you could have two in flight at once, you know, sort of thing. Or three even, if you, if you threw a few, you know. And I threw this one, and I thought, bloody hell, that's definitely not the right noise. It's the wrong noise, you know. So I thought, I'll just throw another one, same direction, you know, so I threw it. And I thought, God, you know, that is the sound of breaking slates. And I thought, the next thing, like, well, I mean, I've got a football pitch to get these bricks in. I thought, where is, where is the, the nearest building with a slate roof? The engine room is too far away. Geogravity would take over, like, you know, like, you... You, you people are under the impression that if you're very high up, you can throw a, a piece of masonry or a brick a long way. You can't, you know. You throw it, and you only get the proje trajectory of, uh, if it's the right word, outward so far before gravity takes over, you know. You might gain a yard or two, but you don't gain a lot, you know, as to what you could do on floor, in a way. The thing is, I thought, there's no way, even at that, we, you know, I was just lobbing them clear of the staging, you know, sort of thing. There's no way it could be the engine room. The boiler house has got an asphalt roof. The oil store, these are the only buildings. The oil store is a green boarded mineral felted roof. The only other building is the office. The office is a single story building with a wooden underboarded roof with 24 bit, I mended it loads of times for the same company. They were Ed Bros tipping gears. Underboarded, 24 by 12 slates like bloody biscuits. No opposition, Akron, ever to one of these Nori Akrington bricks from 270 feet. And I've just thrown two, and definitely without a shadow of a doubt, they've hit the bloody roof of this office. And I can't even see it, you know, sort of thing. And I'm waiting. I didn't know what foot do, you know, I was very frightened, you know. The thing is, the, the next thing I hear the shouting and the screaming from down below through the fog. And I leg it down fully expecting to find somebody dead, you know, like, because it was full of people, this office. Down the bloody ladder three at once, you know. And they're all stood in the back door of the engine room, all white and covered with bloody stone, with plaster dust, you know. They say, Come in here and see what you've done, you know. <laughs> Christ, <laughs> Fully expect to see a bloke lying there with this brick stuck in his head, you know. <laughs> they went in with him. 
this is the most magnificent Cornish moulding that was all round the the inside of the office single story room and sticking out of it there's one of these bricks <laughs> like a piece of shrapnel in turret of the last world war tank you know but another few yards further up and a bit of extra velocity and it would have gone through and this guy sat there with, in his chair with his typewriter in front and the brick is about six foot above top of his bloody head you know God were good to me that day, I'll tell you, you know, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and the, the, they let me off, you know, they didn't tell me to bugger off or anything, you know, but it could have been potentially lethal, you know, it could have been a fatality without a shadow of a doubt, you know. If you're going to blow a chimney stack up, it looks very similar to how it's done for the last 100 years, 50 years, or however long it's been there, apart from... There's a few spots on it of clay and a few little red wires and yellow wires hanging down and that's it, you know. To the hierarchy of the company, it, it looks very okay, reassuring in a way, you know. There's, there'll only be one moment of excitement, that's when there's the big bang. Now, if you have chopped half the bottom away and propped it up on sticks, and they're sat in their office and they've just spent two million quid on high tech technology and machinery just across the street. And they can see the sun setting through this great gap at the bottom of the chimney that they've never been able to see through before. It's always looked so solid and irremovable, you know. They get a bit edgy and they come round asking questions and they, they come looking at you, you know, and all that, you see. Two funny men with flat caps on and a clapped out compressor smoking wood binds all day and chiselling these holes in the bottom of their chimney. And on this particular occasion, we're in the middle of the calendar cable company at Prescott near Liverpool and they'd spent all this money on high tech stuff. And I, I, dinner time come and old Donald, who never wanders far, he sat at the bottom of the chimney with his flask and his butties. And I'd gone on a walkabout round, round the works, just have a look what they did in a way. And it's getting towards one o'clock, time to reconvene at the base of the chimney. And I came back and I said to Donald, you know, are you all right, mate? You know, and he said, yeah. He said, I'm all right. But he said, uh, just after you'd gone, he said, the managing director come over, you know, and he said, <laughs> said what did he want? He said, well, he said he was full of apprehension and fear, you know, and he, he said to me, has he ever had any that went wrong? And dry, Donald, being as dry as he is, he said, well, he said, on average, it's one in every four, and we've just done three good ones, he said. <laughs> We'd got to this job, and it was a similar job to the one I've been looking at today. The chimney were going to land on a concrete floor that had been the floor of the works, you see. And, of course... They don't like concrete floors. They hit the deck and they spread out sideways. They don't go lengthways, they go sideways. And they land on dirt, they dig in like, you know, and they don't go so far. But in this particular case, it were a stone chimney made out of blocks about 9 or 10 inches square and about 18 inches long. An octagonal shaped stack. And the site were a concrete. And the, all the buildings had been demolished. And about 30 yards away over there, there were this car parked in a back street. And it looked quite shiny and all the windows were clean and everything, you know. And I thought, look at that. Been there for three days now and never moved, you know. So there's a lady leaning on the gatepost of a backyard. And I, I wandered across and I said, hey, love, whose is this car here? She said, oh, it's Mr. Brown's. Is I'll go out front and get him to come and see you, you know. So the guy, you know, after a bit, the latch on the back gate went and this old boy appeared and he said, oh, he said, it's buggered really. He said, I, I've sent for scrap man, but he not turned up. You know, he won't, he won't come. Anyway, as I advanced towards to talk to him, towards the car, you could see it was one of them cars that had been lovingly polished from the outside, but the rust were coming through everywhere. From I think it was a Vauxhall, one of them early ones that rusted away. And it and it coming through from the inside, you see. But there were like two cushions on back window frame, back window sill. Tires were up. It, from twenty yards, it looked perfect, you know. But it, it was absolutely rotten underneath, you see. So I said, 
do, would you like me to get rid of it for you? And, it, and he said, why, what would you do? I said, well, if we tow it out there and park it up in direct line with where the chimney's going to come down, when the chimney falls down, it'll flatten it. You know, and the scrap men will take it away then. You know, we have no problem. It'll be flat like a salmon tin. So I said, yeah, do it if you want. <laughs> so we got the Land Rover and hitched it up front and Donald got in and we drove it. We drove it out into the middle of where the chimney were going to land on the concrete and just parked it up and left it, you see. And we carried on chipping away at the stonework at the bottom. And, and the news gets around the neighbourhood when you go to do it, you see. And the crowds begin to gather. And of course, as they keep popping up, you know, from here and there, and they're getting like 20 deep over here and 30 deep over there. They don't know about this car. It, to them, it looks like a nice, new, shiny car. And of course, we've got the lookouts about, so you can't go any further than here, like, you know, and it was what they said afterwards. We just didn't bother because we were remote from the spectators' points of view and all of that sort of thing. And first, at the beginning, it was... Is he not going to move that car? You know, like, that car is going to get flattened if he don't move it, and all sorts of comments like that, you see. And then we lit the fire, like, and then they were all getting excited, you know. If, if he don't move that bloody car quick, it's going to have had it, you know. And then down comes the chin, boom, he's buried that bloody car, did you see that? <laughs> and the kid there weren't even a lump in the stonework, he just flattened it. Just like, it was just flat. You know, I don't. I never stayed for it being dug out. You know, if there'd have been any bugger in it, they'd have been flat as well. Like people often say, "How do you go on when you get too short?" You know, on top of a chimney. You know, and well, the answer is you pee in a bucket. And we've been peeing in this bucket for a week, like, and it was getting full. And we'd just come back from lunch, <laughs> and we've got to make more room in the bucket. You see, and the bucket is is a mixture of urine and cement water, and it's a beautiful summer's day. And at the bottom of the chimney, 160 feet below, there's a scrapyard. And in them days, the scrap men of Lancashire did very well. You know, they all either had a big jag, a Rolls Royce, or some at posh. And this particular bloke had a bright red Alfa Romeo sports car with a black leather roof. And he had the hood down. And Big John, the light lad who were helping me, I said, well chuck it off and we'll make some more room in the bucket like you said buckets full of words to that effect you see and we howl it over the side and and sort of it went down like the consistency of bloody lead shot big blobs it was nearly set like cement you know and all that and it howled down you know and we never bothered about it and at five o'clock we come down the ladder and there's no way you could have done a better job on this alfa romeo with a half a potato and a saucer full of distemper at 18 centres all over it, in equal spots, there were these cream spots of, like, urine and cement water, all over the seats and everything, all over the bloody hood, you know. We buggered off home, and he never knew what it were or where it come from, you know, like, <laughs> and that were, that were it. We got this job, and I was a labourer, labourerless at the time, and nobody helping me. And my dad, who were sort of semi-retired, came with me, and um, we were in this church steeple putting wire netting up to stop the pigeons getting in. And about mid-morning, there's a shuffling up the spiral staircase and the vicar appeared, you see. And he says, could you cut the banging, he said, about quarter to twelve, he said, with a funeral on. So no problem, you know, I mean, out in the bell chamber, looking down through the louvers, you could see the portcullis or the lich gate or whatever the hell you want to call it where the funeral has got to arrive you see and at quarter to twelve precisely the Rolls Royce us pulled up you know and they're coming up the drive the vicar's in front with the with the cross and my dad's looking out the window out the louvers and they're burying a man like Bradley Hardacre out of brass who my dad worked for for 40 years and never got more than twenty pound a week, you know, in a in an hour, you know, bleach works. Uh, the thing is, they're burying him. And they're now disappearing somewhere in the region of the shadow of the tower. And I noticed that the wire that drove the chiming mechanism on the clock had come off the pulley and were resting on the pin that were on the shackle that held a great cast iron weight weighing about two hundred weights 
over a very long wooden box that goes for about 80 feet down the inside of the tower, a bit like a long case grandfather clock. You know, a box, a white box. Now, to get the wire back on the pulley, using the small wooden handrail as a fulcrum round the top of the box, which it were a lead flat with this wooden corner post and one post into wall at church and the other wall into wall at tower light, wall at tower, both corners. The weight is there. Now, for us mechanically minded, we were a bit short on the fulcrum. So we searched about in the dried pigeon droppings and found half a brick. And we've got the half a brick on the handrail, and he's got this plank on me dad, on, on the brick, and the brick, the plank is underneath the end of the weight, me dad's swinging on the plank, and the weight's going up, and I'm flicking the wire onto the pulley, and it's on. And I said, that's it. And me dad, not being a very mechanical man, just left go of the plank, and the brick fell out. Now, unless you've whizzed a brick down a 200 foot mine shaft you won't understand the next bit because the brick goes down the inside of the box boom 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 louver 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 window in apex of roof they're halfway up the aisle with the bloody coffin they all pulled up they thought the old bugger had woke up like you know sort of thing um, <laughs> nobody said anything you know this unbelievable couldn't have made more noise if you'd have wanted to, you know. <laughs> they got a job making a weather van for the top of a flagpole, you see, on a church in, in a village not far from where we live. And we made this beautiful thing with the, the, the Gabriel's horn were a, a trifle on the long side. It looked reminiscent of one of them bloody things off a stagecoach, you know, in the big long. And I knew as soon as we'd fixed it, um, pulling the ladders down, looking up from below, the, the sort of vibration in the end of the Uter, where it were quite flappy, you know, and I thought, that is not going to last very long, you know. Metal fatigue will set in, and the damn thing will fall off, you see. And uh, sure enough, about six months later, Gabriel's arm fell off, just where he's sort of holding it, you know. <laughs> And for the next 25 years, he looked like he had a bloody King Edward cigar going. <laughs> that one that's in garden at home, isn't it? But he did, he did. <laughs> and like Churchill. <laughs> yeah, it's a fact.